Hi, everybody. Al Bernstein here with a very special uh, boxing hangout, um, our last of the year, and it will be one in which we will take a look back at this year in boxing um, as we uh, take a look at what uh, was not quite 2013, which a great, was a great year for boxing, but nonetheless, uh, a year that had many interesting and uh, great moments in it, as well as some that weren't so great. As that uh, a graphic told you, we're going to have a very special guest joining us in a moment. But first, I want to uh, welcome in the man that produces the Boxing Hangouts and uh, does such a great job of it, my good friend and uh, colleague, uh, Dan Parks. Dan, how are you? I'm doing great, Al. Happy holidays, and it's been a great year for Boxing Hangouts this year. We have had a lot of fun. I'll tell you, you know, that the, this whole concept of having these boxing hangouts uh, and being able to talk to different people about all the topics we feel uh, are interesting. And, you know, the, during this year, we, we did topical ones, of course, about fights coming up and fights that happen. And we did many about the historical part of boxing. And I know you were fascinated by those, as was I. Uh, and I, what I love about this format, right, is it gives us an opportunity to explore in long form um, anything that we uh, that we feel like. Exactly, we're able to hit the topics that are that are actually happening at the moment. And you know, we had a really great podcast, a really great show that we did with uh, uh, the gentleman uh, with the Pod Index, and and talked yes. about the, the judging. We were at the Boxing Hall of Fame. We did a total of thirty eight hangouts this year. Wow. Um, I didn't realize until I was just looking it up now, and uh, and we also did six ha uh, of your quick hits, and uh, I think we covered a great uh, a great range of topics, and I'm really looking forward to next year. Yeah, we did. Why well, didn't realize it was that many? I'm tired all of a sudden. <laughs> I was fatigued. I don't know. <laughs> no, and and my thanks to you for coming up with this concept and also making all these things happen. And uh, for this last um, show of the year, we're going to welcome in a gentleman who is. Uh, um, a delightful young man, very talented broadcaster, uh, who, of course, you see on the Boxing Channel at BoxingChannel.tv, uh, Marcos Viegas. Marcos, how are you, buddy? <laughs> hey, guys. Uh, I'm doing really well and uh, ready to wrap up this 2014 and, and get started uh, with uh, what I hope would be a, a good year yeah. uh, in 2015 for boxing and, and just in sports in general. Yeah, we're hope Yeah, exactly. We're, we're looking forward to that. And... Um, and, and, of course, I want to mention that uh, for those of you that watch the Boxing Channel, Marcos uh, um, has put already has had some year-end uh, uh, pieces up, and he's going to have a piece coming up, which is going to look ahead to 2015. Uh, um, uh, I have some year-end pieces up there, including our musical tribute to those that, uh, that left us in 2015. Uh, 14, and so you can go over to the Boxing Channel and uh, and check all that out. But right here, we're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit about what happened in this past year in boxing. And I, I thought the first, even though we've all acknowledged that 2014 was not quite as good by a long shot as 2013. Now there's two parts to that, I think, and I'll be curious to get your your thoughts on this, uh, Marcos. One, 2013 was special by any standards. I, I've called it boxing's best year in its last 25. Now, whether someone thinks that's too effusive in praise of the year, there's no question it was great. So in some ways, 2014 suffers by comparison because 2013 was so good. However, the, the, you can't sugarcoat it. This was not the best year that boxing has had. I think, as so, as so often the case, the people that I think some people overreacted by saying it was much worse than it is, and of course some people probably defended it uh, when they didn't need to. But uh, but this was a year that just Marcos just seems like we had a lot of good fights. There were a lot of good fights. There were some interesting moments, and we're going to talk about some of that. But it just never ignited, did it? No, you know there wasn't any fights really that made people go gaga over them. You know, 2013, we had so many fights, and the one that really capstoned it all was that Mayweather-Canelo fight, and then on the other card with Garcia and Matisse, on top of uh, that Cotto Martinez uh, pay-per-view, and, no, oh, excuse me, not Cotto Martinez, but having Cotto and Pacquiao in that same year. Right. So it made for a very well-packaged year that year, and then we leave that year where we're under the eyes still, or, or the impression, like, hey, you know, Boxing finally 
has their stuff together. They're, right. We're seeing these matchups where the best are fighting the best or the champions are finally fighting the number one contenders, and we roll over to this 2014, and we don't really get any huge matchups up until May uh, with that mayweather Madonna card. Yeah, and uh, you're right. And part of the problem, I think, is that we just didn't end up with as competitive fights uh, this year. And part of the thing is, by, and this is so much... Uh, so true in the sport of boxing, you can look at a match, there were matches on paper that we thought would be better in 2014. Yeah. It wasn't just that mismatches were made, on top of the fact that in, in many cases the, the matches we wanted to see weren't made, even when we saw the ones on paper that looked like they were going to be great, uh, some of them didn't turn out that way. But having said all that, there were great performances this year and there were many great fights. Let's talk about some of the fighters who had banner years in uh, 2014. The first, and you alluded to him, Miguel Cotto, who, who uh, about a year and a half or two years ago looked like he was left for dead uh, in the sport of boxing. Just his career looked like it was in shambles, uh, but he, he changed trainers, went to Freddie Roach, uh, campaigned in the middleweight division, and had himself some kind of year culminated by the fight against Sergio Martinez in which uh, Cotto was able to uh, win the middleweight title in an improbable win, uh, though he may have caught a, a Martinez that was a bit fading. But for, for Miguel Cotto, it was a year of rebirth. Yeah, he's like the Puerto Rican phoenix. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, he, he uh, switches trainers, goes with Freddie, uh, gets a fight uh, with uh, Rodriguez, uh, looks great, but we still have questions like, well, that's a Rodriguez that we're not really sure where he's at. And then he mm -hmm. goes into, like you were saying, this Martinez fight, which on paper we thought, wow, you know, this is a really even matchup. you got a yeah. guy that's bigger, has a tricky style, uh, that's pretty quick, and then uh, completely blows out our expectations. I remember when I was there in uh, the Garden and those three knockdowns happened in the first round, I was just kind of in belief, uh, disbelief. I... I would never imagine in a million years that even if the fight was going to be a blowout, that Cotto would end up knocking him down three times. Right. And it really made us forget about Cotto's prior, prior performances that he had earlier and, and really got us thinking, like, hey, you know, Cotto with this new trainer seems reinvigorated. He seems that he's, he has that passion and fire back to him in, in boxing and speaking with Freddie and speaking with his camp. They all unanim unanimously said, that there's this passion back in Cotto. Cotto's having fun again, that he likes being in the gym now, he likes training, that he's not grumpy all the time. And <laughs> it, it really opened up a, a lot of avenues, and hopefully we get this Cotto-Canelo uh, fight coming up, hopefully, uh, in the next few months. Yeah, and, and the, the fascinating part of all that was, I think, with that um, never in a million years, I thought if Martinez... And it turns out he wasn't really healthy for this, no. or, or the ailments were still an issue for him, and I, I think his body just let down. But even so, it, I, I thought if he has anything left, he's too big and too strong for Cotto, but uh, Cotto got the job done. And Miguel Cotto, you know, he's one of those people, he's like Madonna. He's reinvented himself about five <laughs> times, and he keeps doing it again. Uh, and well, it, let's it, hope he, he doesn't keep fighting till like, he's 50, 55. Right. <laughs> yeah. Madonna, he's making yeah, exactly. Yeah, Madonna may be stretching the limits of rock star. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Cotto, Cotto wears pink, so yeah. you know, <laughs> he does like those colors. <laughs> All right, we've probably exhausted Madonna uh, comparisons. Uh, and having done that, let's move on to another fighter who is um, – who I think had a phenomenal year this past year, Terrence Crawford, who won the lightweight title, uh, going over to Scotland to beat Ricky Burns, uh, and then um, came back to his home uh, in um, Omaha, Nebraska, uh, and fought in front of a huge crowd against Uriarchus Gamboa, who's coming up in weight, and performed exceptionally well in that fight. He, he, he ended up stopping Gamboa in what was – a fight that was good enough to be on many people's lists as fight of the year. Then he went on to beat Ray Beltran, a solid, solid fighter, again in Omaha. And so Terrence Crawford staked out his potential claim to fighter of the year uh, to go along with a couple other people that would be considered. And, you know, I, you, as you watch him, 
And Terrence Crawford's development as a fighter just seems so steady. And in each fight, you look at him and you, he adds a little nuance here, a little nuance there. Um, he's going to be stepping up to 140 pounds, where at 140 and 147, of course, unlike 135, which was a little bit of a, um, a weight class that doesn't have a lot of depth to it, Terrence Crawford adds his name to an illustrious uh, group of names in that division. I can't wait to see Terrence Crawford in against the best uh, fighters at 140. I think that he's very special. You know, uh, Crawford had a banner year, and looking at uh, the level of competition he faced, when this whole discussion of fighter of the year was been thrown around, like my first initial thought was to give it to Sergey Kovalev because he, mm -hmm. he pretty much cleaned out that division. Right. And he beat Bernard Hopkins, even if he just beat Bernard Hopkins on himself. Sure. That was his only fight, and he, he right. beat Bernard Hopkins would be a, a big, huge deal. But I still re really analyzing the, the competition that he fought. Like you mentioned, he went to uh, Burns' home and beat him for the title, mm -hmm. and then he went and beat Gamboa, who was undefeated, who held the title in a lighter division, and Gamboa, of course, was moving up a sure. division. So that's another plus. And then he goes and he fights the mandatory consensus number one uh, in, in, for that organization in that division who many thought was a lightweight champion because uh, of uh, Beltran's fight with Burns, which yeah. many felt that he was robbed mm -hmm. in, in that fight. So I looked at that and I was like, oh, wow, Like he fought a lot of tough guys. And the only thing is when I heard he was moving up to 140, it kind of bummed me out a bit because I, I really wanted to see Linares uh, go ahead and, and maybe... That would have been a very good fight, yeah. Exactly, like, sure. you know, like, that, that's... Because I, I haven't really seen Crawford against a, a really fast and, and not openly... Uh, a guy that gets hit, hit a lot because Gamboa, right. he's fast, but he gets hit a lot. Linares right. is fast and he, he puts his hands up, so he's very sound. But even at 140, imagine a Crawford versus Garcia fight. That'd be huge. Yeah. But... What I like about Crawford, which a lot of people don't do that he does, is he's able to switch so seamlessly yeah. from southpaw wow. to orthodox yeah. and not really get caught up. And he's one of the few guys that's able to, to be just as good, if not better, as a southpaw right. than he is as a righty. Yeah, very rare and, uh, and doesn't yeah. lose any power uh, when he does it as well. You mentioned Sergey Kovalev, uh, 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 who did in fact... Um, run the table with three wins this year, two of them against lesser opponents, but then the, the fight against Bernard Hopkins was was just an amazing win. And what made it more amazing, I think, is the way he won. He was patient. Uh, he, he did, of course, hurt uh, Hopkins later in the fight and came close to taking him out. But this was a fight in which Kovalev showed all the things that people didn't know whether he had the patience, the ability to be a boxer puncher, um, and and show the skills that were honed as an amateur. So you knew the skills were there. It's just would he employ them, and could he do that over the course of twelve full rounds? He did it, and then some, uh, and and stamped himself, I think, as probably the best light heavyweight in the world. So certainly, uh, Adonis Stevenson, who still hopes to be facing him this coming year, and we all boxing fans hope that he will face him, but Sergey Kovalev, Sergei Kovalev had himself a, an amazing year in this past year. I think people still don't really like fathom like how hard it is to look that good against a Bernard Hopkins. Yes, yeah. Like, uh, Even at age 50, right? Yeah, like that's an extremely hard thing to do, and he outboxed the guy for 11 rounds. People don't outbox Bernard Hopkins for 11 rounds, yet knock him down to add to that. So, like, looking at this guy, very, very underrated boxing fundamentals in, in Kovalev. And, and it comes, like you mentioned, from his background uh, in the Russian yeah. system of uh, boxing. And Dan, you know, Marcos is uh, is the young person here in this group, but when we watch uh, Bernard Hopkins, he's still able to even hang in there for 12 rounds. I don't know, does that make you, and you're younger than me, of course, but but does that make you want to go do something that you think you shouldn't be able to do at this age? Absolutely <laughs> not, Al. No, it no, doesn't. No, it doesn't I, under any no, circumstances. No, I have. Right, well, you don't have the, the box, but I have the greatest respect for what he accomplished, <laughs> and I think he has the biggest balls in the world for actually going in yes, there. Yes, he does. And more respect. The legend continues. I don't lose anything off of his legacy, and yeah. I look forward to seeing him in the Hall of Fame. 
All right. So, so it doesn't. But watching him doesn't make you decide you want to go run with the bulls or something you shouldn't do. All right. Gave well, that up already. Yeah. Uh, a, no, we're not none of that stuff. Uh, um, and uh, so now we move to the uh, the two fighters whose names are at the top of the list in boxing in terms of marketability and all the rest. First, of course, is Floyd Mayweather, um, who fought twice this past year. Uh, the first fight. Uh, came against Marcos Maidana in uh, a pay-per-view, and it was a fight that was surprising from the fir opening moments because Marcos Maidana was able to jump on Mayweather in round one. Mayweather allowed it because he came out not moving, being right there, and Maidana was able to drive him to the ropes and be effective. Um, and over the first half of that fight, Marcos Maidana, I thought, had many, many, many great moments. Uh, the fight went 12 rounds, as they always do with uh, with Floyd Mayweather, uh, for the most part. And the judges gave a, uh, not a split, but a majority decision win to Floyd Mayweather. And we look at the cards here, and you see that uh, one judge had it a draw, Michael uh, Pernick, and there, and which is, by the way, is the way I scored the fight. Um, and you can make, uh, you know, a case that I think you make a strong case for a draw. It's kind of hard to make a case for Madonna winning, but you can make the case for, for a draw. Now, uh, the other judges had it by a, a fairly wide margin for Floyd Mayweather. No question Mayweather came on toward the end of that fight. Um, and did he do enough to win? That's, you know, uh, people were debating that. Well, all of this lent itself to the first rematch that Floyd Mayweather has had since Jose Luis Castillo many years ago. Mayweather Maidana 2 was scheduled, it happened, and Floyd Mayweather used those aging legs much better than he did in the first fight. He controlled the tempo and the pace of the match really throughout, and uh, and there was no question that he, in in my mind anyway, that he won the decision. You see, all the judges um, scored it for um, for Floyd Mayweather. So Marcos, we here we have Mayweather uh, getting through these two fights with Maidana, showing that he could adjust as he always does uh, to what happened in the first fight and win convincingly against Maidana. I thought honestly that. It was pretty remarkable that he was able to come back and win that second fight so convincingly when he had had such a difficult time uh, the first time out. Now, you can look at it that way, but then the big question, I guess, heading into the year 2015 uh, is, are we left with the idea that Floyd Mayweather is finally seeing his skills and his athleticism erode a little bit? Or was the first fight with Maidana an aberration? You know, that's uh, that's a tricky one, Al. You know, that's a that's tricky a $64, one. That's a $64,000 question. Yeah, because... I didn't give an opinion until I asked you. <laughs> that's tricky because, you know, we were all thinking that Floyd was slowing down a bit mm -hmm. because of how he looked in that Cotto fight. Yeah. Then he goes to the Guerrero fight and mm -hmm. looks great. And then he yeah. goes to the uh, Canelo fight and looks even better. Yep, yeah, exactly. This the first Madonna fight where we're like, oh, wait a second. You know, I, I think it's a combination of, you know, he's human. So it, there's going to exactly, be... Exactly, yeah. He, he is eroding. Even though it's maybe minuscule, yeah. he is eroding because it, it's natural. He's not a superhuman, you know, he's not some super saiyan, he, he's human, so he's going to erode, his skills are, are, are still sharp, but not, maybe not as sharp as when he was when he was like 28, yeah. but it's a combination of that, and Madonna's style in that first fight, it's just, Floyd's always had problems with guys that try to bully him, or, or get in front of him and, and get in his face, he, he had problems with Castillo, with that same style, he had problems with Hatton, when Hatton was pressing, even though Hatton ended up getting knocked out because of it, and it became apparent in that first fight. And when Madonna went away from that type of style in the second fight, which, uh, you know, kind of perplexed me as to why he wasn't on top of Floyd uh, in that second fight. He, it seems he showed to to want to box a little more, to show everybody that he wasn't a dirty fighter a, as they claimed he was. Uh, and, you know, it, it kind of led to Floyd being able to get him in his game and show 
uh, that you know he's able to adjust it and have such a strong performance. Uh, but you know he's what? What is he now? Thirty-six years of age or, or 37? thirty-seven? Thirty-seven. Yeah. Thirty-seven. So, you know, he is eroding. We're we're seeing that sure. uh, he's not as fast. That that one thing is obvious. He's not as fast as he was. He's not as limber uh, in his legs. But still, him at thirty-seven beats about ninety-five percent of the fighters out there. Right. Well, some would argue one hundred. Um, <laughs> and that, which brings us to course this, and we'll 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 mention this quickly, even though we're not uh, not so much looking forward. Um, we're obviously all waiting, uh, and, and sometime in January, we're going to find out what uh, Floyd Mayweather is going to do next. Will it be Amir Khan, who we're going to talk about in a moment or two? Uh, will it be, of course, the, the, the ever-present uh, idea that Manny Pacquiao um, mm. would fight him? I, do I believe, <clears throat> I'll ask myself this question, do I believe that they are serious about making this fight? Yes. I think that there are talks going on. I believe there are. Uh, there are initiatives being made on both sides, and I, I personally feel that we're probably at a 50-50 proposition uh, of that fight being made, which of course is way above where it was before. It's, it's still not great odds, but um, and I and I and I don't know if it's going to happen. I think the one um, escape clause, if you will, for Mayweather, if you assume that he may not want to make the Pacquiao fight, is him fighting Miguel Cotto. And, mm -hmm. and, and in, in the last week or so, we've seen and heard rumblings to that effect. And that would be the only way, I think, and, and I'll ask both of you this, that seems to me to be the only from a public relations standpoint, or even a, 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 a you know a legacy standpoint, or you you name it, however you want to put it, that seems to be the only thing that would be mildly acceptable to boxing fans now, and would 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 keep Floyd Mayweather kind of quote unquote clean uh, if if that fight was being made. Uh, that seems the only one. Uh, Dan, I'll start with you. Uh, if that happens. Do, do, does the is there less blowback or or you're shaking your head? You you always are. What I love about you is while you're you know you're work you you're, you're very um you know you're in, you're informed about boxing. You're a part of this show. You're doing professional work on it. But you very much have a fan's instinct. So when I ask you a question, I know I'm going to get the fan's viewpoint. So okay, right on, as they used to say. All right, Al. Well, uh, you know I I am one of the biggest. Money Mayweather fans that mm -hmm. there is out there. I, I I think he's really fantastic. Every fight that goes by that he doesn't fight Manny, that that pedestal goes tink, mm -hmm. tink, tink, tink. And if he <clears throat> does not fat fight Manny in this year, um, I saw I saw an online graphic the other day uh, the, that somebody created that I thought was fantastic. And it was in the year 2024, and it had Manny with gray hair, yeah, and, right, yeah. and, <laughs> and Floyd all wrinkled, and and they said, finally, this fight happens. And <laughs> I sure hope we don't get to that place. Uh, it, for his legacy, I mean, he's going to make the Hall of Fame no matter what happens. Oh, of course, he's, yeah. He's 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 there, right? But uh, you know, and and. And he might as well, you know, you could retire, but there's so much time has went in between here. I think he beats anybody else that's out there, honestly, except for uh, maybe Keith Thurman. Keith Thurman worries me a lot. Um, I, I don't think I think he would have a tough time with Keith Thurman, as I think you mentioned also. Yeah, but, even though Thurman didn't fight that one those last fight, I, don't, I think yeah. he, that's there are a lot of factors. But yeah, now so Marcos, given you know Dan just gives kind of you know a perspective that we you know is a reasonable one that we've heard. I, the other thing I'm wondering about is, from the broader perspective of the sport, my general feeling is that one of the reasons the Mayweather-Pacquiao fight needs to be made is because the mainstream media will then get off boxing's back. Um, because even in 2013, when all these great fights were being made, the perception was because the Pacquiao-Mayweather fight wasn't being made, oh, boxing didn't want to make, wasn't making good fights, which it was. So maybe for the sport to move forward, making that fight is important as well. No, of course it is. And, you know, they, they do kind of have a point because we were seeing all these great fights being made in that year, but the most important fight were mm -hmm. pound for pound, 
on that magical list, you know, the number one and number two in the same division yeah. can't fight each other. So it's kind of like you got the top two guys not wanting to fight each other, and you're telling us that the fight, uh, the best are finally fighting the best. He's like, come on, you know, you're, you're the biggest names in boxing not wanting to fight each other. So you know, they, they kind of have a point on that. But if the fight gets made, we're gonna see uh, it. It goes away from just being a a conscious fight for us boxing people and fans, and it tips over and becomes a, a, a global consciousness for the fight in yep. terms where it's going to matter everywhere in the world. There's going to be so much attention on it. And I think if boxing has a great year in which the matchups that are supposed to happen happen, and then to top it off, we finally get this Mayweather-Pacquiao fight, it's going to bring a lot of people who were fans back to it, I, I feel that, we're left with the dirty taste of, oh, this guy doesn't like to fight this guy or doesn't want to fight this guy, and they're going to really look at it and be like, you know what? It seems that boxing's finally getting its it stuff together, and the main reason why I don't watch boxing because of all this politics stuff, <clears throat> and it seems with this fight that you know they were able to make it happen, and you know maybe I'll watch again. And even, yeah, if, they, okay. and even if they charge like $100 for that pay-per-view, people will buy it. Yep. Well, because they'll, they'll all get together, right? They'll yeah. all get together, and you hope that it, it doesn't go that high. But yeah, and and I agree with you. So there's some bothersome to it as well. It's gotten to a point though that if Mayweather does fight anybody else, there's going to be such a huge backlash because I, I'm Even seeing Cotto, right? Yeah, no, because I, I'm seeing online any any tweets uh, whenever Mayweather posts an Instagram post or or tweets. I see this hashtag, Fight Pacquiao, everywhere. It's Fight Pacquiao, Fight Pacquiao, Fight Pacquiao. So it's gotten to a point where I really think if he does fight someone else, there's going to be so much pressure that if not this fight, the next fight, he absolutely has to do it. Because imagine if he retires and never fights Manny, he's going to be haunted by that everywhere he goes. Even yeah. when he's 50 years old, people are going <laughs> to scream at him, you never fought Manny, though. You never fought Manny. People are never going to forget that. No, it's Thanks, probably, by the way, be by true. the way, by the way, thanks, Marcos, for setting the $100 price limit on that, um, by the way. <laughs> you know yeah. what? It's funny. You know, I didn't know this, but promoters actually have a big hand in setting the pay-per-view price. And I asked Oscar, I'm like, dude, like, if this pay-per-view gets made, are you guys going to charge $100 for it? Because we don't want to pay $100 for it. And he kind of, like, didn't want to say anything. And then at the end, he kind of admitted, like, yeah, well, us as promoters, you know, we kind of have a big influence of how much a pay-per-view is. And I think... And he's like, I would pay $100 to see that fight, wouldn't you? And I was like, oh. Uh, oh, that's a trip off. You, may have, you <laughs> may have hit on the exact number it's going to cost. Yeah. Oh, 99 Yeah, 99 Exactly. 99. 99. That's, that's just standard cents. definition. Not, that's not for the HD broadcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, what, well, if you the HD, of course it would be more. Um, <laughs> let's, and, and we were talking a lot about Manny Pacquiao. We'll kind of flip through this quickly, but just to remind you, Manny Pacquiao's year, of course, he also had a great year in effect. Manny Pacquiao's year was important because otherwise we wouldn't be talking about the possibility of a Mayweather-Pacquiao fight because when we last left you in 2013, Manny Pacquiao had been knocked out by one man, Juan Marquez, and it was important for him to rebuild himself. This past year he did that beating Tim Bradley, um, which, of course, many people felt he had done before in a controversial decision. But in, in the rematch, he was able to, to not only convincingly beat Bradley but get the decision. And then Chris Algieri, who, and we can mention this as part of 2014 as well, won, had the upset of the year when he beat um, uh, Provodnikov in what was a really an extraordinary performance by him, being knocked down twice early, terrible swelling around his eye, and yet Chris Algieri was able to, to box his way to a controversial close win over uh, Ruslan Provodnikov, but not, nonetheless fought very well. Then, because of that fight, he got the fight against Manny Pacquiao. Now, I was one of the people that didn't think it was a totally inappropriate that he fight Pacquiao because he had won that fight with Provodnikov. I thought that was an, enough of a win with an undefeated record to get the fight. Now, as it turns out, and this is a separate issue, many people said, well, he's not well known enough, so from a commercial standpoint, it, it isn't going to work, and guess what, it didn't work, because they didn't get a huge buy rate, but from purely a boxing standpoint, I didn't think it was inappropriate. However, it was a terror. It ended up being a completely one-sided fight, of course, and Manny Pacquiao 
beat Chris Algieri and and completed his year at 2-0. And, and, and because of the dominance of that win and because he controlled the Bradley fight so much, we're, we're left with the possibility, of course, uh, at least of him fighting Mayweather. Now, the other person that believes he may have a shot at fighting uh, Mayweather and was in the Mayweather uh, sweepstakes before is Amir Khan, who had himself quite a year in 2014 because he won two important fights, beating Luis Colazzo um, and then coming back to beat Devin Alexander uh, just this past month, in fact, this month in December. And what was important, I think, about those two wins is the way he looked. He was he was the new version of Amir Khan to the umph degree. He was a good boxer who didn't engage in brawl in the brawling uh, when he didn't need to. He was always he's like you know Virgil Hunter has him like a and I'm going to use this word in quotes has him programmed and you can almost see the wheels turning in, in Amir Khan's uh, head. Go in, throw my combinations. Don't stay too long at the dance, move away. Repeat the process, move away. So what that does is it makes him still an exciting fighter as Amir Khan, and he was always an exciting fighter, but it keeps him out of harm way better. And of course he was able to totally control Colazzo and Devin Alexander. Now, some people will say, well, that's not Floyd Mayweather, it's not Manny Pacquiao. But here's what it is. Luis Colazzo had never lost like that before, and he was coming in off a couple of wins, including the knockout of uh, Victor Ortiz. Um, and Devin Alexander, while he had lost, of course, to Sean Porter, had not been controlled over 12 complete rounds like uh, Amir Khan did. And so Amir Khan had himself an amazing year. And I'm going to flip ahead and then get your comments, Marcos. The other Brit that had a great year this past year, one of the many Brits that did, of course, was Kel Brook, who came to America and took the title, the welterweight title, away from Sean Porter, who had won it from uh, Devin Alexander. And the reason I throw this in right away here is because for, uh, for Amir Khan, should the and this is a situation that every fighter on the planet I think would like to be in should the Mayweather fight not come to fruition he can probably make as much money or maybe even more to fight Kell Brook in front of thousands and thousands of people in uh, Great Britain uh, in what would be a very entertaining match so maybe your comments Marcos on both these fighters Khan and Kell Brook who both had good years and part of the rejuvenation, not rejuvenation, but part of a great year of boxing in uh, the UK. I say have Amir Khan fight Kell Brook and then the winner gets Mayweather, so it gives us a yeah. chance to, to um, get, these guys, get these guys out of the way, so uh, no obstacles for a Mayweather-Pacquiao fight, please. <laughs> but, you know, yeah. uh, Amir looked great. He looked, wow, he looked fantastic. Um, for that Alexander fight, I think we're all thinking it was going to be competitive. Uh, you know, yeah, at least no, it looked like it should have been. You know, but it wasn't. He completely blew him out, which uh, really surprised. And uh, I think Amir is really, he's coming into his moment. Like, you see, yeah. like, his body frame and his structure. It seems like he, he, he finally, like, got his man strength. Like, he's a man now, you know? Like, yeah. he has all, all that natural strength in, and he seems really that uh, he's in a groove now with, uh, with Virgil. He's not as reckless as he once was well, with Freddie. Um, and he's still able to be flashy and entertaining. Uh, yeah, that yeah, matchup yeah. with Kel, though, that matchup with Kel Brook is a dangerous one for oh, yeah. for mm -hmm. uh, Amir. I think that's an even harder matchup than Floyd would be. Because, I agree. Because of the I punching agree. power that Kel has. And Kel Brook showed us, and I, I've, I, I will say this, I usually don't uh, toot my own horn. Uh, unlike most, uh, I love when I listen to sports talk radio, and guys <laughs> are on there, and of course I did sports talk radio for years, if they even gave a hint that a certain team was going to beat another team, they talk about how they predicted it right for, for 20 minutes on their own show. Uh, and I, Number one, because, of course, we're often wrong. Uh, I think it's a mistake to do. But I will, but I am going to, I will be 
uh, somewhat uh, um, Colin Coward-like <laughs> and say that I always felt Kelp Brook was a solid fighter, even though a lot of people were denigrating him. And I, while you couldn't say for sure he was going to come in and beat Sean Porter, I always felt he had a chance to do it. And I think he's such a technically proficient fighter and a sound fighter. Uh, and, and I believe that he is... Um, he is just really superb, and you made the point, Marcos. And we, you know, we talked about it a little bit on the end of our the show that we went, uh, that we did on Showtime, where we showed the con con beating Alexander. This isn't to suggest, and I agree with you a hundred percent. And I said it on the broadcast that night. We all want to see Manny Pacquiao fight Floyd Mayweather, so I'm not putting forth Amir Khan as the a better choice to fight Manny Pacquiao. We all want to see the Pacquiao fight. But if somehow the Pacquiao fight didn't happen, the point we were making on that show, and you alluded to it, is Amir Khan has his, his – this Amir Khan that we're looking at right now that uses his height and his length to box and doesn't stand in harm's way is a very difficult opponent for Floyd Mayweather. Um, and let's remember also Mayweather is not a big puncher, so – to some degree, Khan's chin, chin issues don't don't have a big bearing, although that's not to say that Mayweather might not be able to hurt it. But this version of Khan, it, very tough uh, for Floyd Mayweather. But you are also correct. Kel Brook is a different kettle of fish. He's a different kind of fighter who hits a little harder, has, has certain other skill sets. So uh, I think it could be intriguing, uh, you know, if they were to end up uh, fighting each other. Um so those are, those are fighters that we just talked about that really did a great job this year. Now, the flip side of that are a couple of fighters who didn't really have an opportunity to show us how great they are for, due to a variety of reasons. The most perplexing probably is Andre Ward, who sat out, you know, the entire year uh, as he continued in legal battles with uh, Dan Goosen, uh, his promoter. Uh, he has suffered an injury. He was battling an injury, and then, then you know, even once that situation was 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 handled, uh, has been out for virtually the entire year. And to compound this, uh, during the course of this year, Dan Goosen passed away. Now, his company, though, uh, Goosen Boxing, still is dealing with the lawsuit that. Andre Ward uh, has brought. So we have Andre Ward sitting on the shelf, not fighting, and at you know just north of 30 years of age now, his skills are not on display for boxing fans, which is very, very difficult. And Marcos, you, you know, you, you've covered Andre Ward as have I. I know Andre very well. Uh, I'm actually in the, for me, the last year was very bittersweet because uh, I can count as two of my good friends in boxing, Andre Ward and Dan Goosen, and it was very difficult for me to see them in that um, uh, difficult situation. And then when Danny passed away, dealing with the grief of that and seeing the how that to see that impact this as well, this was a very odd situation, but. Boxing fans are, are robbed at this moment of Andre Ward's skills and watching him fight. You know, it's a situation in which you see a fighter in his prime, uh, a fighter that's so good and so skillful, and if you were to put him on a piece of paper and list the skills that he has and you compare him to Floyd mm -hmm. Mayweather and you see, you know, they match up. Absolutely. And, and if not, you know, you could say that Andre has a little bit more skills of, than Floyd in some areas. Yep. And, and to see someone of that high talent level, like you said, not display his skills, it's a sad situation because uh, by all, Andre Ward's the last gold medalist we had mm -hmm. uh, from our Olympic team. Like, True. You know, uh, he's so good, and he's he's a good guy. He's not a trash talker. Yeah. He, he doesn't seem to be super materialistic. He seems like he's a very family-based, grounded guy, and to see him not not fight it is it's it's really a bummer. It's like I hope like that when he does fight, when it's soon, that this uh, period is not a period in which he was in his prime and it slipped away from him 
for when he comes back, he won't be as sharp as he would have been had he fought continuously uh, last year. And, and you know, all those things you said about Andre, you know, are true. I devoted the whole chapter in my book to him saying basically those things. But you know what? And I, and I it, it, it has to be said, this exile is self-inflicted. Um, he lost several arbitrations mm -hmm. uh, that, you know, he's, he, this battle hasn't gone well, and there, were, there have been many indications that would have indicated it was time to give up the ghost on this, except the time you have left with the Goose and Promotions. You're mostly going to get the money that you would get from HBO and whatever they were going to pay for the fights and, and, and move on. Um, now, everyone has a right to do what they feel is appropriate for their career, and that's what Andre Ward is doing, but it's a shame because, it, um, it, it again, it, we don't have a chance to see him. Now, another fighter who has been absent from the sport uh, for most of this year, early in the year, uh, Mikey Garcia fought um, Burgos. Um, that was in January, won that fight, but since then has been embroiled in legal uh, uh, battles with Top Rank, his promoter, and he remains on the sideline. Uh, they're working to try and uh, fix that. But Mikey Garcia, also a fighter who, uh, you know, has unlimited skills, it would appear, uh, even though he's, he had a couple of uneven performances and difficulty in making weight, he's clearly a, a terrific fighter, and, um, and we're waiting to see him in action. And the other fighter that I'll mention, and we can toss him into the hopper, uh, Julio Cesar Chavez Jr., also involved in battles with top rank, uh, legal battles, then went and signed with Al Heyman, who is a manager, not a promoter, but nonetheless he and Top Rank don't really do business with each other. And there are many rumors that they're very close. Uh, it's been reported in the press uh, of making a Chavez Jr. Carl Frotch fight. Love uh, to see that. This year. Yes, wouldn't we all? That's mm. uh, and, and once again, the voice of the fans. Uh, <laughs> and, 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 and you know what? That is the one we all want to, we want to see that fight. Um, so we're hopeful that these men can can get back in the ring. This too is part of what where boxing suffers, um, you know, from a PR standpoint. Because sometimes people look at this and they it's hard for them to understand it because it doesn't happen in other sports. You know, the Denver Broncos are never sitting out because they're suing the NFL. You know, it just uh, it just doesn't happen. Um, uh, although as a Cubs fan over many years, I would have loved it had the a, a lawsuit prevented the Cubs from playing because at least I wouldn't be tortured by losses. Although that's all about the change, let's be honest. Now with Theo Epstein and Madden and um, Lester, it's all going to change, and we'll have the World Series in a couple years. But that's another story. Um, let's, let's hope. Let's. You got yeah, do, does that sound nice and delusional? Do you like that? No, oh, but did you ever see Back to the Future Part Two, where they had that big display, Cubbies win World Series? <laughs> I guess, and so there you are. It's in the movies. It couldn't possibly be false. Um, so, so we have all these fighters. Hopefully, they come back. But what we mentioned, Carl Frotch, and I want to get your 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 feelings on this. Carl Frotch and and George Groves fought in what was the event of the year uh, in this past year. Eighty thousand people at Wembley Stadium. It was part of what was you know we talk about the year not being so perfect in. Uh, overall, worldwide, and certainly in the United States, not being the best year for boxing. But boy, if you live in the UK, um, you you would never say that, would you? Because it was a fantastic year for boxing, and that Frotch Groves fight was the ultimate example, wasn't it? They had 80,000 people at mm. Wembley Stadium to see those two fight. That That's crazy, and that's not a Floyd Mayweather, that's not a Manny Pacquiao that's no. a Carl Frotch, someone who went to Atlantic City a few years ago and, and fought Andre Ward, and it's just, I don't know, it blows my mind how someone like yeah. Carl Frotch and George Groves can get 80,000 people over mm -hmm. there. And, and not only that, it, it was a good fight. The first one was a yeah, great fight. The first one was a great fight. And, of course, yeah. the, the, the controversial decision is part of yeah. the stoppage is part of what made it happen. But still, 80,000 is 80,000, yeah. right? It's crazy, you know? And then you go with the Cleverly Bellow 2... Mm -hmm. uh, and, and you get all these other guys, I, I believe, like Fury Tyson Fury. Fury and Yeah. Banks, Billy Joe Saunders. Yeah, yeah. It's on and on. I did a fight over there. Uh, on this, but I go over and do the fights on Channel 5. We had a, some great, great fights. Uh, a, a light heavyweight matchup, um, Travis Dickinson and um, – why am I forgetting the other gentleman's name? Um, 
Oh, Betty Clarkson. They had one of the great, one of the most exciting light heavyweight fights I've ever seen. And boxing just has rolled along there, and it's it's in a great position. And they got a lot of prospects too, especially the their heavyweight Anthony Joshua. That Tremendous. guy looks wow. like he's going to yeah. be the guy. Yes. Like forget Klitschko, he's getting you know a little bit mm -hmm. up there career wise age. You know we have the Stavern and Wilder, but even though this guy, those two are are farther along in their careers in their development than Joshua, uh, he looks like he's going to be the guy. Uh, coming up in the next two, three years. And, you know, we were kind of fooled by Price, who was also had, you know, the same, who had the same skill sets. He was an Olympian, uh, but obviously was betrayed by his chin. I don't think Anthony Joshua is going to have that issue as much as Price did. I agree, Anthony Joshua, and, and uh, you know, uh, really it, it, extraordinary uh, fire. Let's look back real quickly at a couple of uh, other, let's look back at, at, at at a fight from last year, and I w I'm going to name it my fight of the year, and you have a different one in mind, which I, I would certainly make a case for as well. Um, for me, uh, last year, the uh, Lucas Matisse, John Molina Jr. fight ended up being my pick for fight of the year. There were many others that, that could have been, uh, there were, well, maybe not many others, That's I guess, but there were some others that could have been. Uh, but I thought Matisse and Molina, um, which on paper, looked like it might be a terrible mismatch because, you know, Molina stepping up in weight to 140, Matisse a huge power puncher. Well, it turned out that it was Molina whose power early in the fight got Matisse down, and then Matisse was able to come back and win the fight in a very dramatic fashion. Now, I thought that fight was terrific, but you have another fight that you think is fight of the year, and, boy, I, I can you can make a strong case for it. Explain that to us. All right, so... Not even televised on HBO mm. or Showtime. There's this fight in Mexico, which involves Orlando Salido, the, the well, guy man. that when you fight him, he wrecks you. Regardless yeah. if he wins or loses, he wrecks you because yes. he's just a rough fighter. Uh, going up against this tough Thai guy, and Thai fighters in general, because of their upbringing, because many of these fighters also are Muay Thai fighters, and Muay Thai training is... Yeah. They're, it's tough training. It takes a lot to, to stop yeah. a Thai fighter, like knock him out. And, and this guy is a strong guy, uh, Koi, uh, Koi Kit Jim. So Salido versus Koi Kit Jim. Now, mind you, an, a, a fight that happens after that fight is another fight of the year candidate in which Takayama fights Rodriguez. But this fight, there's eight knockdowns in the fight, two of which happened in the first round. I, th I think it happens within the first minute of the fight. It, when I saw that fight, I literally... Jumped out of my, yeah, I jumped amazing. at my computer screen when I watched it, and th that's how I base a fight of the year. How my my reaction is when I see the fight. If it gets me to a point where it gets me away from analyzing it, and it gets me to a point where I'm like hyped up in the emotion of right. it, th right. that's that's a great fight. And and this fight did that. Uh, and it's just knockdowns after knockdowns. You see Salido hitting to the body, really trying to invest. You see the uh, Koi Kit Jim, those body shots are taking effect, but he still has his power, and he's still able to knock down Salido. It's an insane fight. Eight knockdowns. That's cr You don't hear yeah, it. So that's a lot eight of knockdowns. knockdowns. That, that's a lot. We get excited over a knockdown, a single one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Orlando Salido has been in so many of those fights. I was privileged to announce the, both of his fights with Juan Manuel Lopez. Oh, man, those Juanma fights were crazy. The oh, crowd man. was crazy. You got yeah. hit in the head. Yeah. <laughs> I, got, I got hit in the head with a, with a water bottle. So even I was in danger during that fight. But it was amazing. So that, that is a good one. We're going to close this conversation out by, by looking back at one other thing in, uh, in this past year, and it will help us look ahead as well. Uh, and we've alluded to... Uh, to this gentleman a couple times already. Um, Berman Stavern won the WBC heavy version of the title, um, though we all acknowledge Vladimir Klitschko is the universally accepted heavyweight champ, but uh, he won, Berman Stavern won the, the WBC version by beating Chris Ariola this past year. That was a, the fight was interesting on many fronts. One, Chris Ariola came in in shape, which he doesn't always do, and he came in in shape for this fight, ready to fight, he and Berman Stavern put on a terrific exhibition of heavyweight boxing. The fight was televised on ESPN, which is another thing we'll get to in a moment. But it was exciting. Uh, early in the fight, 
Ariola was uh, was able to hurt Stavern. Looked like he might get get him in enough trouble to take him out. Then Stavern was able to come back. Ultimately stopped um, Chris Ariola in what was a wildly exciting, great heavyweight fight. And we clamor for good heavyweight fights. We talk about it all the time. You know, many of the fights by Vladimir and Vitaly Klitschko in recent years have not, in addition to the fact that they seem less accessible for U.S. fans, though they're wildly popular in Europe uh, and other parts of the world, uh, their fights have not been scintillating. This was a scintillating heavyweight uh, matchup. And yet, it was on ESPN, which is accessible to more people. It's not premium cable like Showtime or HBO. And a little under a, uh, a million people tuned in to watch this fight, which is not a great TV number for a fight that is available in a universe of, what does ESPN have, 150, 160 million homes, more than that. Um, and and well, it's still cable TV. It's not over the air network. It's essentially what we think of these days as free TV. ESPN, which is known for its great cross-promotion, didn't really get the job done. Uh, they didn't really do their magic on this. Now, they did it, but apparently didn't do it as well as they needed to. And the other flip side of this is boxing fans, for whatever reason, weren't willing to tune in, even though it didn't cost them anything, uh, and many of them had the ESPN. Marcos, a question to you. How much of that was due to ESPN dropping the ball, and how much of it was boxing fans maybe feeling heavyweight fatigue or whatever and not buying into the fact that this would be an exciting fight? Hmm. That's, that's an interesting point you, you bring up. Uh, you know, I feel ESPN could have marketed the fight a little bit better. I agree. Uh, you know, I, I didn't see any really, like, heavy pushes uh, for that fight up until, I think, like, two days before the fight. Yeah, and they have uh, all those, 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 those. Yeah, those I think platforms. they could have cross-promoted cross -promoted it a, a little bit it. better. Uh, yeah. You know, I think a, a lot of it has to do with the fact that Stavern is not very outspoken. He's very sure. mild-mannered, quiet, so right. he doesn't get a lot of hype. He's not going to talk right. trash, and... and I think that there was some fatigue on on Chris Arroyo's part, where fans yeah kind of people felt, not buying into would he be yeah, ready yeah because you know we've heard him say before like oh yeah I'm back I'm ready and then he comes yeah. in and he he doesn't make weight or he's out of shape so I think it had a lot of those factors but I think the biggest ones were uh, Stavern being a very mild mannered uh, mm -hmm. fighter uh, and what you just mentioned as well that people not really buying into this in shape. Uh, Chris Ariola, uh, because of we've heard it so many times before. Now on the flip, yeah, and and here's now here's where we advance the story. Uh, Chris Ari or um, Berman Stavern is going to defend his WBC title January 17th in the fight that I'll be happy to broadcast and uh, be able to announce on Showtime against Deontay Wilder, who. You mentioned uh, Andre Ward being the last one to win an Olympic medal, uh, Olympic gold medal. I believe Wilder is the last American to win a medal of any kind. He won bronze. the bronze medal in in the Olympics. And here's what's interesting. I was as we were before we came on here. I was looking at the uh, seating charts that are available at the uh, uh, at the MGM where this fight's going to be held. And you know what? Not that many tickets available in that big arena. Already. And already wow. for wow. that fight. Fascinating. And this isn't like some, I just went on their website. So this isn't, you know, you know how we frequently get um, promoters suggesting things are sold out and they're not. I was just a person on the website looking for a ticket and, uh, and not that many available. Mm -hmm. So it's very possible they're going to sell out that huge arena. Uh, we would anticipate doing very good, you know, uh, viewing numbers on Showtime, and I believe, and, and you guys can both correct me if you think I'm wrong, I think it's almost impossible for that not to be an interesting fight. I don't think it can be a 12-round hug fest, because no. mm. I don't see it going that way, and uh, and I think something exciting has to happen. Uh, would you say that's a fair assessment? 
uh, these guys are heavyweights. Like, <laughs> you got a guy that's knocked out just about everybody he's faced, yeah. Wilder, uh, and then you got a guy in Stavern who knocks people out as well. And you know yeah. Wilder is going to come out strong for those first four yeah. or five rounds. He's two. He's never even been past four rounds. Yeah, exactly. He's going to want to stop uh, Stavern in those first four rounds. And Stavern is probably going to want to be like, you know what? I'm going to let this guy gas out right. and try to take him into deep water. So you, you, right away you're going to see Stavern, uh, you know, be patient and Wilder bring in the heat. And it's a matter of can Wilder consistently for those 12 rounds be able to pace himself. Right. I, me personally, I think it's going to end in a knockout. Uh, I agree. Either way. And you have to know that Stavern is going to want to come on, even if he wants to get him to that five or six round period. You know Stavern's going to come on like gangbusters, like he did against Seriola <laughs> in those middle rounds. Yeah, he so is. Not as if he's he going to try to win some decision. You know, and my thing is, Wilder, can he handle a, a, a heavyweight, legit right. heavyweight punch? Uh, you know, I saw a we fight in that. which. Yeah, no, I saw a fight in which an earlier fight of his that he got hit. The referee ruled it a slip, but I felt it was a knockdown, and the referee had to kind of like bring him up, which right. kind of made me like, hmm, like, what, can he take a, a punch or not? So it's really interesting. I want to see how he does with a guy like uh, Stavern, who who's a, just solid, overall solid guy, really yes, solid fundamentals. Solid yeah. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. Well, that fight from last year, you know, I thought was, to my way of thinking, was foreshadowing of what's to come. Uh, I'm going to ask both of you guys for your, 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 your final thoughts on, about 2014 and also looking ahead to 2015. How do you encapsulate the past year, and what are your hopes for the coming year, Marcos? How I encapsulate the past 2014. I would say that if we could get less bad decisions, mm -hmm. case in point, Good, yeah, that's there, true. Case in point, uh, Bradley versus Chavez. Yeah, and, and Benavides versus Herrera. Yeah, others, that's yeah. Who, oh man, he should have been fighter of the year. <laughs> <laughs> he's terrible. Like, he's like good luck Chuck. <laughs> yeah, he, you're right, exactly. God, I interrupted you, I'm sorry. <laughs> but, you know, less bad decisions, uh, and maybe mm -hmm. it's, you know... Uh, I don't know how we and better matchups. I think with the matchup, well, yeah, we have from yeah, better matchups. If you know, if these champions would face, you know, at least someone who's ranked top three, yeah, not exactly. like fringe contenders, and, and we don't get like mm -hmm. uh, matchups like Salka versus Garcia or or other things like that. Uh, you know, I, I think it'd be a, a good year. And the you know what? Here's the thing. I think we're starting to see a little bit of it now. People just need to push their egos aside. And do good business, you know. That's you, fair may, you know, you may have a big ego, you may this or that, but at the end of the day, if you push your ego aside, you're still gonna make a lot of money making these uh, big fights. And I think, you know, you would you would think that would be the the catalyst. Like, you know, I, I can't stand this guy, I don't like him, but you're gonna help me make hundred millions of dollars and I can look past that. Mm -hmm. Dan, are you optimistic about two thousand and fifteen for boxing? I am, Al. I'm very optimistic, and, and I know that I've read a ton of articles at the end of the year here. A lot of them have been uh, slamming on uh, uh, our, our Lord and Savior, uh, Mr. Heyman. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm going to tell you something. You, know, you I, have it, not thanked one time during this, pro this uh, thing. I'm shocked. <laughs> I'll tell you what, you know, and, and again, there's been a lot of haters out there, and I'm going to tell you that, it, you know, he has, there's obviously been a lot of records of, of fights that weren't made. But he has set up a beautiful platform for next mm -hmm. year. There's a lot of fights that can be made, and arguably for more money they would have been made for if they would have happened this mm -hmm. year. So I'm excited for next year. I, I, if, you know, if I could go up there and, and, and say, you know, Santa, bring me a present or something. I, I needed extra for, for the holidays. I would really love to see two Mayweather-Pacquiao fights this next year. Yeah, no, like yeah it would be great if the first one's excellent, and then there's another one. It yes, could be yeah. better than that. That's what I'm looking for. We love sequels. Movies and boxing love sequels, right? So that's, you know, we, we wouldn't mind having that. Um, Marcos, I'm going to let you go, and thank you so much for, um, uh, for uh, visiting with us here. Thanks for your great work on the Boxing Channel. You no are you, you're doing a fantastic job. Uh, and uh, one of the most pleasurable things for me in the last several years uh, has been uh, watching you develop as a a terrific broadcaster, um, and um, 
I'm uh, very proud that uh, uh, of the work you've done. Well, thank you. I, re I really appreciate it, and uh, you know, reason why I am where I'm at, and uh, you've seen my development is because of you. And uh, I, I thank you very much for helping me and guiding me. Well, uh, you have a, you you're the kind of person that would get an opportunity anyway. But I'm very happy that I was able to play a small role in that. And you're uh, you're going to do a great job for many years to come. And uh, and and I and and boxing fans will enjoy having you chronicle the sport. So, um, and thanks for coming on today. And Dan, I will turn to you as we close. And uh, from a uh, from the boxing hangout standpoint and the stuff we're involved in, I'm looking forward to 2015 as well. We're gonna we're gonna continue to do our quick hits where I get a chance to comment on uh, events quickly and nimbly as they happen, and also these hangouts where we we get to do in long form as we did right here, uh, talk about, uh, you know, boxing in a, in a, in a relaxed setting where you can really delve into things. Absolutely. Al. And you know, next year we've got a lot of things planned. We've got some more boxing, uh, history hangouts coming up. Yep. Uh, sure, we're going to do, we're going to do a couple of offsite things that are in the works, which yes. I'm very excited about. And, uh, I'm not going to let that out yet, but that's something I'm very excited about. And, uh, you know what? If we can get lucky and get a couple of uh, these mega, mega, mega fights, uh, the the sky's the limit. And we're going to have a lot more participation hangouts this year, where you, the viewers, are going to be able to come on board right here. You can be right in the the lineup and talk to Al and talk to our special guests and uh, join us. It's going to be a great year for us. That would be a lot of fun. Well, again, thank you, Dan. Happy New Year to you as well as uh, to Marcos and uh, also to all of you out there. Thank you very much. You know, I've been at this for uh, a long, long time, and I'm heading into the, uh, amazingly, the 35th year of, started in 1980, so we're headed into the 35th year of doing this. Luckily, I started when I was 10 years old, so that makes me, what, 45, I think. <laughs> but, but I was, you know, I was like Doogie Howser, right? I was only 10 when I started. But um, but it's uh, it's been a long, long ride, and I... Uh, I want to thank all of you for allowing me to help chronicle this sport over this long period of time. And I'm very excited about these kinds of, this medium. Of course, being involved in the Boxing Channel and the Internet was uh, part of this. And being able to do all these uh, these these hangouts that, that Dan has created. And, and, and to have this medium where there's no gatekeeper. We can come to you and, and you just get to click and watch. And it's unfiltered and we get a chance to really... Uh, really present all these uh, our opinions and our hopefully some insights to all of you is 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 just great and um, I look forward to another year of it. So have a happy new year, everybody, and let's hope that 2015 is a great year in every way and certainly for the sport of boxing.